Welcome to the second video on neural nets. In part one, we looked at the neural net architecture or structure. We talked about the input and output layers and some hidden layers in between. And we also looked at it as um, a type of a regression where we have all these derived variables going on. We also talked about training a network using data and about the back propagation algorithm. And finally, we just mentioned the problem of overfitting with neural nets. In this second part, we're going to look at the user point of view. And in particular, we're going to look at what is needed in terms of the inputs that the user has to supply in order to train and deploy a neural net. We're going to look at five particular steps. First of all, like in any predictive algorithm, we're going to have to choose predictors. Unlike some other methods that might do some variable selection for us, neural net is not going to be that generous. At step two, we're going to talk about some pre-processing steps that help with improving the results of using a neural net. And then we're going to specify the architecture, meaning the layers and how many nodes and that type of information. Step four talks about some parameters, and we already talked a little bit about two main parameters, which is the learning rate and the momentum. And finally, if we're going to use a neural net for classification, then we're also going to need to specify a cutoff value. But that is something that we've seen with other algorithms as well. So let's go and see each one of these different points. Choosing predictors. Because neural nets can capture very complex relationships, it means that it's going to squeeze out any possible piece of information from predictors that you give it. This means also that we're going to need very high quality predictors. If the quality of the data that gives us the predictors is low, the neural net will not be able to extract a lot of information out of it. In step number two, we talk about pre-processing the raw data. If we have a predictive task or a numerical outcome, then typically we're going to transform the outcome variable if it's very, very skewed. In regression, we typically take a logarithm transform, and that is also common when we're using neural nets. If we're going to be using a logistic or a hyperbolic tangent activation function, then it is also typical to scale either to 0, 1, or between negative 1 and 1. However, these two types of pre-processing operations are a bit controversial. Some people claim that the algorithms work without them. It's always worth trying. If it's a classification task where we have a binary outcome, then we're also going to have to take whatever outcome variable we have and turn it into a dummy variable so that we have zero and ones instead of text. That, of course, is dependent on the software. Now that we've specified the first two steps, let's look at the network architecture. This is also something that the user will have to determine. We're going to have to determine, first of all, how many hidden layers we're going to have. Many software packages will only have a single hidden layer for computational reasons, but also practically, it turns out that a single hidden layer is usually sufficient. The more hidden layers we have, the more complex of a relationship that the network can capture. However, you also get the danger of overfitting. The other type of structural selection that we have to make is how many nodes we're going to include. Now, the input and the output layers will have a number of nodes that is determined by the number of inputs or predictors and of outputs. So what we need to determine is how many nodes to include in each hidden layer. And like with the number of layers, the more nodes, the more complex of a relationship that we can capture, but also the bigger the danger of overfitting. So this is a balance that we need to explore in every particular type of application area. If you're using Excel Miner, you'll find neural nets in both the prediction and the classification menus. You'll notice that in both cases, we have options for choosing the number of hidden layers with a maximum of four layers. And for each one of these layers, we can determine the number of nodes. Next, we also have to choose the parameters of the algorithm. Now, of course, the software will have some defaults, but it's good to know what these parameters are actually doing, and sometimes tweaking them in this way or the other might lead us to improved results. In particular, we talked about the learning rate, 
which we denoted by LR or L. And here, if we choose low values for the learning rate, we're going to be downweighting new information, which means that we're not learning very fast. There's a good thing about this in that we don't quickly shift into new data as it comes in and maybe overfit. We remember some of the training that we did earlier on. On the other hand, if it's too slow, then we're not learning enough. The other parameter that we might want to change is called the momentum. And what this does is it keeps the algorithm going in the right direction. If we have high values of the momentum, then the parameters are going to be changing in the same direction as the previous iteration. They won't be jumping up and down in different directions. If we want them to jump in different directions, then we're going to have to take the momentum value and bring it a little bit down. So again, these two parameters are going to help us a little bit with trying to control the overfitting on the one hand and the learning ability of the algorithm on the other hand. Again, if you're using Excel Miner, here is where you can make the choices about um, the learning and the momentum parameters. Finally, if we have a classification task where our outcome is binary, for example, then we're going to have to choose a cutoff value similar to any algorithm that we've been seeing up to now. The problem is that when you're using neural nets, the probabilities that we're going to be chopping up with a cutoff, they tend to cluster around 0.5. And in that sense, we're going to have to look more carefully at those probabilities that we get the propensity scores at the end in order to choose a cutoff that actually gives us reasonable results. How do we choose a cutoff? Well, the usual method of looking at a holdout set or some extra validation set and seeing when we're overfitting or when a cutoff seems to be robustly working on different sets of new data. So let's quickly summarize what are some of the advantages or strengths and the weaknesses of neural nets. Here's the good part. First of all, neural nets are pretty good at capturing very complicated relationships between inputs and an output. They're more intricate than a linear regression or a logistic regression by having all these derived variables and functions of derived variables. And in that sense, they're useful when the relationship is really complicated. Secondly, when the data are very noisy, neural nets are known to be pretty tolerant or robust to this type of noise. So these are two good things about neural nets. But then we have to consider some of their weaknesses. First of all, since this is a data-driven method, we're going to have to feed it a lot of data. So you need plenty of training data in order to train a model or a neural net properly in order to predict new records. Second, we have inputs, we have outputs. We know that there's something going on in the middle, but it's very untransparent. And that's why neural nets are called black boxes. You give them inputs, you get outputs, but you're not really sure how the inputs were combined in order to derive the output. In applications where transparency is very important, for example, in insurance claims where you have to show that you did not deny insurance based on um, some illegal conditions, this would not be a good choice. Next, some methods like trees, for example, will give us some nice variable selection. We can see at the end which predictors played an important role and which did not. In neural net, in our black box neural net, we don't really know which variables played an important role. Overfitting, this is really the keyword with neural nets. It is very easy to overfit. Just choose lots of nodes, lots of hidden layers, and you overfit very, very easily. This is like fitting a very high order polynomial to a bunch of dots on a scatter plot. So be very careful with the choice of the architecture and with testing and evaluating for overfitting. If you're going to be extrapolating, again, this is going to be somewhat of a problem because you train the neural net on a particular universe. And if you want to step outside of it, if the network did not see any instances from outside of this universe, it's going to have a lot of trouble predicting there. We talked about this iterative solution where we train the network until it converges in some way. The problem is that you might end up with a network that has weights that might not converge to the global optimum, but to some local optimum. We can tweak parameters and test and play with different things, but you just have to keep this in the back of your mind. Neural nets require you to explore. There's some trial and error that you're going to have to go through. The last 
weakness or challenge with neural nets is computational complexity. This is going to take some time to run. And the more nodes and the more layers, it's going to take longer. So if you're thinking of a real-time application, think very carefully and evaluate your ability to run the neural net sufficiently fast for your needs. To close this video, put on your thinking cap for just a minute and ask yourself, in what types of applications would neural nets actually be useful? And why would they be useful? You can also think about the opposite question. In what applications would you not like to include neural nets and for what reason?